Hello, this is Father Gregory Pine, one of the assistant directors at the Thomistic Institute. Uh, delighted to welcome you back for another installment of Off Campus Conversations, where we follow up with Thomistic Institute speakers who have given lectures on campus or beyond. So that way we can chase down some of the insights from their lectures and grow in the knowledge and love of God. So for this installment, I'm very delighted to be joined by Professor Tom Osborne. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. It's nice. It's nice to be involved with the Institute and this kind of activity. Hey, cheers. So um, many folks will know you from your many publications and interventions, uh, Thomistic Institute and otherwise. Uh, but for those who don't know you, would you say a word, you know, who you are, where you're from and what you do? Well, I'm Thomas Osborne. I'm at the Center for Thomistic Studies. It's a graduate program at the University of St. Thomas. So it's part of our philosophy department. I teach undergraduate and graduate students. I was an undergrad at Catholic U near the House of Studies. I knew some of the young Dominicans of that generation. Masters from Boston College, PhD from Duke. Then I went to Toronto for an LMS postdoc. My first job was at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, but I've been here for 20 years now. I've published books mostly on ethics and moral psychology. So a book on the love of God and love of self and 13th century ethics, oceans of, you know, is Aristotle's ethics selfish? Is it based on self-love? If so, in what way? I published a book on human acts, and Thomas Aquinas, Scotus and Occam, the important differences, uh, the important either contributions or confusions introduced by later figures. Published a little book, Aquinas' Ethics, that's the cheapest one, it's paperback from Cambridge, and then a longer book, Thomas Aquinas on Virtue, but I've got a lot of publications on all sorts of things, faith and reason, political philosophy, causation, McIntyre in the 20th century, Anscombe in the 20th century, so published on lots of different different issues. Excellent. Yeah, I in listening to the lecture that you gave, or well, describe what the lecture was about here uh, just in a minute. But in listening to the lecture that you gave, you have the virtuosity of both the researcher and of um, not like, what's the word that I'm looking for? Popularizer is too crass, but uh, of the teacher. Uh, sometimes you have somebody who has a, a very well-prepared text, and then it comes to question and answer time. And it's like, well, within methodological bounds, I don't know if I could say, because strictly speaking, that falls without, you know, dot, dot, dot. But yeah, in the question and answer session, you were wheeling and dealing in a very responsible, but also exciting way. So that gets me pumped. I kind of just wait for question and answer sessions to see how, see how things will go. And uh, when somebody just plays footloose and then does the theological equivalent of Kevin Bacon, I, I oh, revere no. that. So kudos. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. You can safely say that. Perhaps, perhaps best not to, um, thereby testifying to my own irresponsibility when it comes to images and metaphors. But alas and alack, moving on. Um, the lecture that you gave in the context of uh, the Aquinas Philosophy Workshop was specifically about sin. Uh, and you described it, or you led in with the description of how sin is the, like one thing that God doesn't create, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is a provocation, but a good provocation. And then you kind of set out the metaphysics of fell choice very carefully in describing, okay, what is present to it? What is absent to it? What do we mean by lack of order? Or what do we mean by lack of kind of right reason? Um, and in what sense can we say that God's creative you know, power is at work in the act itself and not at work in its perversion or in its lack of rectitude? So um, with, with any kind of mystery, be it a luminous mystery or an obscure mystery, we, we kind of find ourselves interpolating among fixed points as we try to circumscribe what can be known. Um, well, that sounds like the conceit of a human mind overblown in its uh, self-estimation. But as we try to say something coherent or rule out things that are incoherent. So when it comes to this question of sin, what do you think are some good starting points, principles, and arguments that we need to have in place just by way of kind of overview? Yeah. Well, first, I think it's important to think about sin as a kind of evil that God can't will. God in some way wills other evils. So sin is very peculiar. So you've got just a problem with sin in general. You know, what 
but then a bigger, more general problem with evil. So you have the, the two issues are related, but distinct. Because with evil, people will often just say it's a privation of the good. And God can't cause privations. And that's true or clear enough. You might have something like blindness, right? What causes blindness? Well, it doesn't have a cause. It's a lack of being. I mean, maybe if you somebody destroys the eye, but that's not, that's the corruption of the eye. That's not blindness. And so when Thomas divides evil up, you have for humans the evil of sin and the evil of punishment. But you also have corruption in creatures. So you have lions eating their prey. A lion eats uh, an antelope. I don't know if lions eat antelopes, but I'm just thinking they might. But whatever they eat, you have the lion destroying the antelope. And so there's the corruption of the antelope. What's the lion doing? The lion's eating. And you have to have this in order for the world to exist. So the evil involved in the corruption of material bodies, Thomas thinks everything below the moon is corruptible. You, you have this corruption. And in a way, God doesn't create the corruption, but he wills it. The same thing with punishment, right? So I decide to... I get angry with somebody at a conference. They disagree with me. You're talking about my liveliness. I punch them in the nose, right? Well, that's not a punishment. That's a sin, okay? But if I get the civil authorities involved, if I say, look, that's a wicked person, and I find something else they've done, well, that's a sin on my part too, but it could be a punishment from the poor. From, in terms of law, if they've broken the law. Say, for instance, if I've noticed, they said something I don't like, so I've noticed, well, look, he's parked in front of a fire hydrant, so I call up the local police, they get a ticket, they're punished. Uh, in a way, punishment, then, is willed as a good, and you can will punishment, and God wills the punishment of sinners. Sin is something funny because it's an action, it's something willed. It's not even like the lion willing to eat the antelope. There you've got the corruption of the antelope, but the lion's willing something good he wants to eat. People are willing something good when they sin, or angels, but it's not really good. And so there's a special difficulty with sin, both with respect to just does it have any cause, what is the cause, and then with respect to God's causation. And those are two philosophical issues, although they're difficult in a way because of, well, I mean, anything connected with God is difficult. It's so hard to think about his causation. We know so little about him. It's hard to know what's demonstrative and what's dialectical when Thomas is writing about it. But that's, I think, the real problem, is sin. In what sense can evil, how is it that we can will the evil things? God can't, right? God can't will evil things, but we can will them, not under the aspect of evil, but we do will evil things. And all intellectual creatures can do that. It's part of being created out of nothing, that unlike God, evil's a possibility for everything created, and the evil of sin is a possibility for every, anything with an intellect. Things with intellects have wills. They can will something bad. Don't know if that helps set it up a bit. That does, yeah, it does very much so. Um, so as I'm thinking about, you know, your initial commentary, I think maybe a good way to proceed would be to progress through the four causes insofar as they give us a kind of handle on the main issues here and to talk about the four causes of sin. And this is a kind of bastardization, but just for lack of better descriptions, and you can correct the imperfections that I introduce, like the material cause is the act which God does create or which God, you know, gives the, the kind of creative impulse to. And then the 
uh, efficient cause, I mean, we say there's not really an efficient cause, there's a deficient cause insofar as the efficient cause kind of falls down on the job. A formal cause, well, here we're talking about a privation, so a kind of lack of form that ought to be present. And then final cause, it is ordered to a good, but a good that does not reflect the rectitude, which ought to be present in it. So if we could take those one by one and then just refine some of our insights, the one, I think the material causality is interesting to me because, okay, so we're saying that God, you know, he, he, he gives rise to all being and to all doing. So the creative agency is itself God's gift, which he initiates, right, which he, which he sees through. You made reference in the lecture to a kind of Jesuit notion of concursus, which you said is ultimately unhelpful and incoherent. So how is it not like a sneaky move to say God creates the act, but he doesn't create the perversion of the act, or he doesn't, you know, like he's not responsible for the defect in the act? How do we parse that metaphysically without being overly cute or precious? Yeah, well, you've got the being of the act, and all being is has to be created from God. The causality is only one way. Otherwise, you've got problems. We're causing <laughs> changes in God's knowledge, limitations to God's power. But part of the problem here is that we tend to think of God like we think about... It, we either think of him as somebody making something out of marble, right? And so we think of him as a creaturely cause, or we think of him as some sort of human superior. And so when we think about the being of the act, we can't think of him causing the being of the act in quite the way that, say, somebody makes marble, right? And it just passively undergoes the change. The being of the act of sin, I mean, the work itself can involve many different acts, many different faculties, but it's a sin insofar as it's a willing something that is not according to the proper rule of reason. And that's what makes something a sin. So described formally as a sin, it involves this disorder with respect to reason. But it's not just the disorder. It's not just the fact that we don't think about what we should be thinking, but we will that in some way. Or we will that even we, we, we put it into action. Just thinking by itself, if the thinking is not voluntary, would never be sinful. So there's a defect of reason there, and it's the willing that makes it sinful, right? Uh, the clearest example would be, you know, I um, I need some money, so I rob a store. Well, I'm thinking about the money, not about the fact that it belongs to somebody else. That's what really characterizes it as a sin. And so when we talk about God's causality, then, what's he doing? Well, he's causing our willing, but is it causing something in the way that, say, a sculptor's causing it? No, because he doesn't have that goal of uh, making Michelangelo, uh, not, or Michelangelo making a, a Moses out of a piece of marble. But what else is involved here? Sometimes we might think of God as a superior. So if our superior permits something, the superior might say, well, it's okay um, if you're going for you, for you to have divorce in your society because you're hard-hearted anyway, and so we're going to allow you to have a, a special uh, divorce certificate, right? And so that's a kind of permission where it's spoken. Well, that's not really what God does either. It's not like, well, I know you're weak, and so we're going to permit this to happen and make it somehow legal or illegal. Or we're not going to say, well, I know that Irish people, they can't really control themselves eating meat, so on St. Patrick's Day, we're going to let them eat meat, even though it's a Friday in Lent. It's not that kind of permission, okay? And in general, 
when you're allowing something to happen you or, or you let something happen, sometimes you're responsible for it. So we've got a ship channel here. We have pilot boats. They're supposed to direct people through the ship channel. It's shallow on the sides. So suppose the pilot just wants to look at his phone and he's not paying attention and he lets his ship go into the side. Well, he's not directly acting on it or causing it, but he could prevent it, right? And he's bound to prevent it because that's his job. And so with God, we can't think of him as some sort of superior. We can't think of him as making our wills the way that a sculptor might make uh, the shape of Moses out of a block of marble. We can't think of him as somebody who's obliged to do things because of his role or position, since everything that he creates is outside of that, right? He's not obliged to stop every evil. And so that's, that, that's, I think, what the problem is. It's so easy to think about this issue using false analogies or false similarities. So, so that's the thing. He, he definitely causes all being, including acts of the will. His will is infallible. But what characterizes the act of sin? And then what does it mean for him to cause the sin? It's not like our other ways of thinking about causation. And ultimately what characterizes the sin is this dis disorder, right? Although it's something positive when we will it. So our act of willing, we're willing something good. Or even in a case of a mission, we're willing something that's accidentally maybe even connected with the sin, like I'd rather look at my uh, iPhone rather than tell the person, you know, to avoid running aground. But it's, uh, it's voluntary. There's, there's something voluntary, some good, and then there's a defect, but it's a creaturely voluntary. By definition, sin could only be a creaturely will. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. So I like the corrective, um, you know, the way that you conceive of God helps you better to conceive of his quote unquote responsibilities. And you see this with respect to the evil of corruption or the evil of punishment. Sometimes people will make a kind of Buddhist objection, like it's God's responsibility to minimize suffering, which is a kind of subset of the best possible world type argument where God is like an operations research analyst who's trying to maximize or optimize the material conditions of the universe running around like a traveling salesman. But like when the misprision is pointed out to you, you're like, right, not his responsibility because not his nature and not his, his operation, right? That, that's not, it's not what he's motivated by. I mean, he's motivated by himself, but insofar as we're included in that motivation of himself, that's not, <laughs> that's not what's at stake. So yeah, thanks. I find that, I find that very helpful. If there weren't some good, we'd have real problems though. <clears throat> If, the, if God weren't able to bring good out of evil. So if he just created things that were evil in themselves, that, that would be crazy. That would be, <laughs> there is no such thing as evil in itself. But if he allowed these evils and there was no good drawn out of them, that, that, that would be a problem. And so it's a problem if the wicked aren't punished. It's a problem if innocent people uh, suffer. It's a problem that has to be addressed in a way. But philosophy can only get you so far. It can tell you that God can draw good out of evil. It can't really point you to what good. And we shouldn't expect, though, to be able to identify every good, right? And so I've often wondered, what, what's the good that God gets out of mosquitoes? Um, how do they contribute to the perfection of the universe? You may have biologists who would listen to this and be very angry with me. They might know better. <laughs>
but surely in general, I mean, it's just, if you think that you somehow know the order, I hardly understand the order of my own family or my own institutions or what's going on around me, never mind the whole universe, to think that you, you could show that God could draw good out of evil, that good can be drawn out of evil. You know that it has to happen, but to try to point to particular instances is a problem. I mean, unless you're looking at some very basic things, right? The death of animals for something else, like the lion. That's Augustine's example, or sin and punishment. Or Thomas also mentions martyrs and patience, right? If God didn't allow uh, tyrants to persecute martyrs, then we wouldn't have martyrdom. Um, so he draws a good out of that. But it's very hard to see sometimes. Um, I haven't thought about this before, so this might be a little rough. Um, but I was reading Labordet recently on the preambles of the faith, and he was talking about how some uh, natural theologians will make an argument that providence can be proved, and then he cites a bunch of textual warrant in St. Thomas Aquinas that it can't be proved. Um, so at the very least, that's a contested point. But provided that providence can't be proved, like on sit, I mean, it's a further a further bridge to cross to go ahead and, and prove quid sit. Um, but, but it strikes me that the distinction that you draw between the philosophical response to what good can be drawn and the, and the theological response to what good can be drawn shows the importance of providence in the conversation, because it's like, okay, God is orchestrating all things strongly and sweetly unto the praise of his glory. But to the degree that you can sympathize with that, or that you can see that, behold that, I mean, by approach, believe that, then you'll have a more intimate and sublime entry into the types of goods that might be drawn forth from. But if you don't, then you're not going to have the sympathy. You're not going to have the vision, which would be able to marshal the reasons for which. Like, again, it's not our responsibility as human beings to, like, defend God as if he were in the dock and we were his attorney. Um, but, but it strikes me that, like, the obscurity of that type of argumentation, why it has certain philosophical limitations, which are then transcended by, you know, theological, whatever you would call them, um, you know, conceits, some might say, but theological confidences. Um, yeah, I think that it's, we're, we're coming up against the edge of the mystery right there and saying, yeah, I mean, like, like you said, I, I don't know the order of my family. I don't know the order of my own room, and I'm the only one who abides in it, you know? So, yeah, that's, that strikes me as, as a good point to be hammered out in this particular setting. So I don't know if you have if you have thoughts on uh, the relationship between the providence of God and then the the coherence, as it were, of this good out of evil type situation. Yeah, well, I, well, I think that there's a couple issues to consider with respect to philosophy or natural reason. Okay, first, there's the question of how much can be demonstrated about providence by Saint Thomas. I think that's a real problem. I've seen good arguments on different sides. And there's often been disagreements among interpreters. Look, Thomas often gives things that look like philosophically demonstra demonstrative arguments, for example, in the Summa Contra Gentiles, and they really are good arguments, but they aren't demonstrative because we don't see or know the premises the way that we should. You know, they're valid arguments, but we don't, they don't give us demonstrative knowledge. And uh, with respect to providence, you have this degree, disagreement between two great commentators, Thomas de Cajetan in the early 1500s and Dominic Benyes, you know, some years later, late 1500s. Cajetan thinks that a lot of the issues around providence are, are probable arguments. Benyes thinks they're demonstrative. Um, the second the fact that you don't have a philosophical demonstration doesn't mean that you don't have good reasons for believing something. So it seems to me that whether or not they're fully demonstrative, and they're unlikely to be demonstrative for most people, you can still have good reasons for believing in providence. And Thomas gives those in the first part of the Summa. Um, and there's also the problem, look, to have implicit faith to be saved, what did people need? Thomas thinks before the coming of Christ, at least, some notion of God and providence. So in some ways, those need to be especially available to everyone, uh, whether they accept it or not, or whether it's their own fault 
uh, directly or indirectly, these are different questions. But I think you want to say that if there's a God, it seems like it's very hard to know about him. And you can't show that he can't bring evil out of good. And there's certainly at least very good reasons for thinking that. I mean, good out of evil. He, you know, you can't say that he can't bring good out of evil. And there are at least very good arguments, if not demonstrations, for the position that he can. But what they are, theology gives us a better account of both providence and what those reasons might be. Right. Um, okay, so pursuant to that, I'm kind of abandoning the the four causes of evil because I find this line of this reasoning interesting. Um, but what would be the shape of the arguments that would issue from that understanding of providence and the bringing, you know, good out of evil? So I, I you know, you you made mention of mosquitoes. You said there's probably a biologist out there who, listening to this, would think, "Holy smokes, you just don't understand the ecosystem and how reliant is it upon, you know, the existence of mosquitoes because we just we just experience." their bite, and then their poison. Um, so do, do you find that a lot of arguments, uh, like philosophical arguments of this sort, tend to look to an ecosystematic harmony that is established by it? Like, this evil is permitted so that in the final reckoning or in the overall vision, it comes together more convincingly, coherently, or whatever else? Um, or are there, are there different tacks that we adopt in making those types of arguments? Um, yeah, I don't know if you've if you've summarized that or if you've synthesized that? Well, I mean, some of the arguments Thomas talks about in his commentary on the book of Job. Right? And with respect to sin and virtue, it seems like in this life, at least external goods are distributed pretty evenly. You're not going to be healthier or have more material goods by being a virtuous person. And so there's this kind of disorder. And so Thomas takes it as an argument that there has, that there has to be rewards in the next life. He treats the whole thing as a kind of disputation. People try to give different arguments. Uh, although at the end, uh, God, uh, responds to Job for his presumption and trying to think that he can so clearly see that he's uh, it is approach to the issue. But Job was fundamentally correct in thinking that there's some sort of rewards or punishments in the in the future. So there's those kinds of arguments people can make. The problem is they aren't demonstrative, but I still think there's something to them. People usually poo-poo them and say, well, uh, clearly, uh, there's no reason to think that. Well, I, I don't know. There's something distinctive about human actions. We can see them as deserving of reward and punishment. We can see that these rewards and punishments don't happen in this life. So that's one kind of argument. It does seem to me fairly feeble. It more or less opens us up to revelation, I think. But revel in Revelation gives us something better than we ever imagined. But it's very hard to see how, how evildoers are punished. That, that's a problem, too. But one problem I think people today have is they, they tend to think of punishment as somehow itself just corrective or a bad thing. And so Thomas thinks that justice restores an order that was lost by punishment. So, people, so if you really understand how bad sin is, then there's a punishment that's due to it. It's a problem if people aren't punished. Uh, I, I think people now have a hard time. They tend to think of sin like a weakness or sickness or something, right? Along the lines of, I don't know, even a mental illness, right? Some people can't distinguish between uh, severe mental illness causing involuntary acts and vice. But vice is very voluntary for Thomas, or at least the acts proceeding from vice. Mm. And only we cause that. 
right? That's that that's up to us. I mean, in other words, Thomas loves to use the example of the limp. Okay, so what kind of cause does a privation happen? Well, there's something positive in the limp, namely the walking, right? And so this is caused by the mode of power. What's the limping caused by, though? It's the problem with the leg, right? So if you ask what causes the limping, there's a deep there. There's something defective there in the leg. You can't blame the limping on the person's uh, ability to to move. They're willing, moving itself. That causes the walking. The limping's due to something else. Uh, and so, with respect to God, you can't blame it at all on him. There's something very strange about sin, that it's an act that really belongs to the person who does it. And so it really uh, deserves punishment, right, in a way that, say, mental illness or physical illness or all the other evils we suffer, right? There's nothing, it's a deserving punishment. It's a different kind of evil. So that that's the problem with sin, and what makes it especially hard to see how good could be drawn out of it, because it's such a distinct and strange kind of evil. Um, okay, so I think I I want to formulate one more question, um, and in that response, you began with reference to Saint Thomas's commentary on the Book of Job. I'm thinking of another great commentator on the book of Job, G.K. Chesterton, uh, who in his introduction to the book says, you know, when God arrives on the scene, I mean, he's always on the scene, but when God arrives on the scene in Job 38 in the whirlwind, he comes not so much to answer the questions that Job has posed as to ask further questions. He says something, you know, charming, like he he responds to Job's skepticism with a deeper skepticism still. Um, and he doesn't mean that in the sense of like, you know, bad skepticism, but I think in the sense of like the questions themselves aren't just those of an armchair psychologist who finds it cheeky to be evasive in answering questions so that way is liable for less and seems profound. It's like, no, these, these questions actually have a kind of tendency to them, a trajectory to them, and they help us or they kind of facilitate our entry into what's really at stake. So like to go through the inky blackness of the mystery of iniquity and get to the radiant clarity of the mystery of, of divine life. So I guess maybe just kind of by by way of final thought or parting thought or final commendation, um, what what do you think is the role of this discourse in our own appropriation of life's difficulties? Because each of us has to answer for ourselves the mystery of of human suffering. We have to answer to it in our own experience if we hope to have it um, what make any sense to us. Um, so like this philosophical approach, kind of giving way to a theological approach, as you demonstrated in the lecture that you give and. And, and in this conversation as well, like how, how can we at our various levels of, of ability pursue this type of discourse in a way that proves fruitful, not in the merely therapeutic sense, but in a more robust mm -hmm. metaphysic sense? Well, the, the, the most important thing with respect to people's lives is to not attribute their own sins or other sins to God and to see that there's a special way in which sin belongs to them, in which their good actions don't, and certainly not their meritorious actions, right? So our meritorious actions, these are just due to God's generosity working in us, uh, the virtue of charity, causing our actions, acting with them, cooperate, are we, our wills cooperating with God. But the fact that they have merit at all is, is not due to ourselves. It's due to God. And so our good actions, in the sense of merit, the actions by which we merit something from God, these, in a very real way, come from the fact that God prepares something for us that he wants us to share and that would be beyond anything we can imagine. I mean, the good here is not proportionate to anything we can think about or imagine it just swamps any evils that we experience in this life or could imagine in this life. There's no, no connection at all. And I think people don't see how great that goodness is 
at least for the people who end up in heaven. Just that sheer, there, there, there's nothing. We, it's so far above anything that we can imagine, the goodness there that's offered to us. And our actions by which we attain it themselves are just so far beyond anything. But, uh, but sin, sin is something that God causes in the sense that he causes our wills, but he doesn't cause the sin. It's not caused as a sin. So sin is the one thing that's due to us. It's like the limping is due to the leg and not to the moving power. And sin in a very real sense belongs to us. And so sin is something that we cause. Merit is something that primarily God causes. And so when we think about the final order or the final goodness at the end that would be brought about, that we believe about through revelation, you'll have the predestined in heaven and the reprobate in hell. Hell is bringing goodness out of people's bad actions. It's restoring a certain order there. Hell is entirely deserved because the principal cause there is the human being. So reprobation is not something God doesn't decide to reprobate people and then cause sins for the sake of reprobation. God allows people to sin, but the sin is due to the person and the reprobation is proportioned to the sin. With heaven, it's the other way around. God chooses to save us, and then our good deeds are created in us for that, and we cooperate. Uh, they're moved, we're moved, we're created, we're given grace, we're moved to perform meritorious acts. And so that's not due to us at all. That's due to God. And so in practical life, people have to realize the greatness of the good to which we're called, uh, but according to which the present evils are nothing. And second, the complete gratuitous nature of it, that all the good is from God, and the, and the bad, at least the sinfulness, is from ourselves. I think that's absolutely key. The details for ordinary people are less important. Um but the, the general picture is, is just key to understanding what our connection as Catholics, our connection with God, and then the two possibilities open for us. Yeah. Yeah, apropos of that final comment, I'm thinking of uh, St. Thomas in a reply to an objection, makes reference to three kind of dark passages in scripture, the marriage of Hosea, the prophet Hosea and Gomer, the despoiling of the Egyptians, and then the sacrifice of Isaac. And he gives his response to each as to how God in, in, this, in these instances doesn't contravene his divine law. And in the case of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, he says, <laughs> by virtue of sin, we all stand before him as deserving of punishment, or we all stand before him as condemned, which is a terrible thing when you think about it. But then, you know, in, in your lecture, you made reference to the fact that you know, First Timothy 2, 4, God desires that all be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, that he gives grace which is sufficient, which is to say, you know, grace is antecedent to, well, graces which will eventuate in, in justification. They don't necessarily in the lives of all to whom they're extended, but that, yeah, that's real, that God really desires that all be saved, and that we can't circumscribe that in a very narrowly or Calvinistically interpreted Augustinianism, that it's, there's something there. Uh, and the fact that there is something there is just simply astonishing. <laughs> So, all right. Well, again, thanks so much for, for taking the time to have the discussion. And I'm sure the listeners on the podcast will certainly profit from it. Um, you made reference at the beginning of the conversation to some of your publications. Um, I was hoping maybe at the end, if you could just describe a little bit um, the University of St. Thomas of Houston, the Center for Thomistic Studies. Is it possible for people to study with you there? If so, what types of degrees might they pursue? Yeah. So the University of St. Thomas, we're a small originally liberal arts university in Houston. We have a strong undergraduate core, which includes lots of philosophy. We have philosophy majors. We have a graduate program, the Center for Thomistic Studies. We have a lot of very good professors in Thomism and ancient philosophy, trying to relate it to contemporary philosophy. Somebody who used to teach the Eastern Province Dominicans, 
you know, Dr. Brian Carl is the director. We have a master's degree, a PhD. A lot of our students have uh, had jobs at Catholic colleges, seminaries when they finish with us. There's also a joint MA uh, program with the Department of Theology for people who are interested in something like that. So that's that's what we do. It's a Newman College school, so it tries to be particularly attentive to the Catholic aspect of education. And the philosophy is certainly uh, at least fundamentally Thomistic, although we study other things, of course. Excellent. Yeah. I, I For a while there, I kept reading books by professors at um, either at the time or, you know, at present uh, who were teaching there at the University of St. Thomas and specifically in the Center for Thomistic Studies. So it was like a cumulative effect of, mm. of amazement. I was like, you mean to tell me that yeah. he teaches there too? Yeah. An embarrassment of riches. <laughs> um, Wonderful great. place. Yeah, yeah. So, so folks can follow up with you and your publications um, mm. and then also, you know, potentially there at the school as well. Yeah, just email me if anybody's interested in something. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. All right, turning then to you, the listener, thanks again for tuning into this episode of uh, Off Campus Conversations on the Thomistic Institute podcast. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the podcast on YouTube or on your podcast app. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's what we have for you. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast. 